Oh, sorry. Looking at the attendees, it's all people from my lab. Oh, really? <laughs> Well, we're up to 30 and it's 12.01. So I'm gonna start your introduction and then we'll get started with the talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Harris. John is the chair of dermatology and the director of the Autoimmune Therapeutics Institute and the director of the Vitiligo Clinic and Research Center at UMass Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's a dermatologist and physician scientist and he cares for patients in a vitiligo specialty clinic and runs a research lab that's focused on understanding the disease pathogenesis and developing new treatments. Um, his group integrates basic translational and clinical research strategies to accomplish this. And as a result, um, he's been involved in several early stage clinical trials in vitiligo that are showing promise and success for patients. And I think we'll hear a little bit about that today. Um, and he has also founded Valeris Therapeutics, which is focused on developing an effective long lasting treatment for vitiligo as well as neurobiosciences, which is focused on treating inflammatory skin diseases. And I actually worked as a postdoctoral fellow and an instructor in John's lab from 2013 to 2019. So um, I can speak very highly of his uh, effort to help patients and, and the awesome science that he does in his lab. And so I'm very excited to hear about his talk today, which is titled Translational Research in Vitiligo, Launching a New Era of Targeted Treatments. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, so I'm actually showing a bunch of your data here today, as you probably shouldn't be surprised at. Uh, I'm excited to give uh, a talk today to everybody. Thanks for joining um, about what we're doing in vitiligo. Um, we've been studying vitiligo for 10 to 12 years and, and really uh, in the last five to six years put on a strong translational push to study human tissues and, and really understand vitiligo better uh, in a clinically relevant way. And we're excited about what we've what we found and where we're going. And, and uh, I'll take the next 45 minutes or so to, uh, to to walk you through a story, kind of trying to 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 tell it beginning to end how we how we made um, these observations and what they've meant clinically. All right. So these are my disclosures. Uh, there aren't really any conflicts yet. Nobody makes any drugs for vitiligo. We're hoping that'll change soon. Uh, and, and we'll briefly be discussing off-label drug uses. There, there aren't any on-label drug uses for vitiligo, uh, except for monobenzolether of hydroquinone, which essentially makes, makes disease worse. So we have to do a lot better uh, to treat vitiligo. I wanna take a second to put in a plug. Um, Jillian mentioned I'm the new chair of dermatology at UMass and, and also founder of uh, the Autoimmune Therapeutics Institute here. And we're recruiting. So um, we're really excited about this institute where we, we hope to bring together um, physician scientists from multiple disciplines, not just skin, but including skin, but other organ systems as well, to really study autoimmunity in a holistic way uh, to develop therapeutics to treat lots of autoimmune diseases uh, beyond vitiligo, beyond skin disease, um, but for everyone. We're also recruiting medical dermatologists for, for UMass into our clinics and, and looking to support and establish new specialty clinics. So if you want to be a, a specialist and start your own clinic, this is a place to be. Uh, we don't have leaders of these clinics yet, and, and so this is a, a great opportunity, I think. All right, so this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. We'll talk about our, our research strategy, our approach to study vitiligo. We'll, we'll talk about two uh, specific targeted therapeutic approaches uh, that have resulted from the research uh, in now in clinical trials, um, as well as uh, my company, Valeris Therapeutics. Uh, we'll talk about translational research and using skin blistering as a tool to do that. Uh, I think this is a really fantastic way to gain, to, to get lots of cells to study um, in a translational way. Uh, the omics approaches that we've used to dig a little bit deeper than, than these two uh, pathways. And then uh, I'll end off talking about uh, the role of Tregs and vitiligo, a little bit of, um, this is uh, unpublished data. And, and so I'll do this all in about 40 to 45 minutes to leave time for questions. So vitiligo is really common. It affects about one in a hundred people. That's a lot of people. And half the patients who get vitiligo do so before the age of 20. So as a clinician, I have to think about uh, optimizing patient management over an entire lifetime, over decades of time. And as a physician, uh, as a physician scientist, it means I can study this disease over decades as well. Uh, and so I think vitiligo provides a great opportunity. For, for both research and to help patients. Vitiligo has a lot of disease associations. Uh, and so I put this picture to remind me to tell you, this is a patient with vitiligo on the hand. Uh, you can see under Wood's lamp and on the abdomen here. She also has an insulin pump uh, for type one diabetes and she has a colostomy bag um, 
for Crohn's disease. And so vitiligo is associated with lots of other autoimmune diseases. And we feel as we study vitiligo, we're not just studying vitiligo, but, but all these diseases as well. So this is how vitiligo begins. Most of you are aware. Uh, these are two little macules of depigmentation here and here. And those grow and coalesce into larger patches. This is a typical presentation on the hands. Um, and it can become quite widespread and psychologically devastating for patients, uh, particularly because vitiligo affects visible areas. And in fact, the quality of life of vitiligo uh, is, is reportedly uh, affected to a greater extent than, than those with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. So really not just a cosmetic disease, but, but has a significant impact on patients. The good news about vitiligo is it's fully reversible. So this used to be a white patch, and now you see lots of little brown spots filling that white patch in. And those brown spots are coming from the hair follicles. Uh, so this is where melanocyte stem cells live. When we repigment the skin, uh, it comes from the hair follicle uh, in, in a very specific pattern. This has implications for, for people who have white hairs uh, or poliosis in their vitiligo, it does not repigment. Or if they have vitiligo in areas that don't have hair growing, glabrous skin, also very difficult to treat. So this is a woman, uh, actually a, a pretty typical case, who is treated with Naraban UVB for a little over a year, and you can see a beautiful response. She said this changed her life. She was wearing low-cut dresses again, uh, very happy. I saw her at six months, I remember, in the clinic and just encouraging her and saying, you're doing a great job. Your, your neck and your chest look fantastic. And she said, what about my face? And I said, what about your face? And she said, it used to have vitiligo all over it. Uh, and, and so at six months, she was at the point where she had completely repigmented her face to the point where I had forgotten she had vitiligo there. Great response. So this patient walked into my clinic one day, as you can see, with widespread vitiligo. And he had also received a kidney transplant for unrelated reasons. So she, he was on chronic uh, kidney immunosuppression uh, for his kidney. And he repigmented faster than anyone I'd ever seen. And, and so this told me if we could put all of our vitiligo patients on chronic kidney level immunosuppression, their vitiligo would do great. We know the rest of them would not though. Um, and so we thought maybe we could develop a targeted immunotherapy that would improve treatment responses, but also be safe. We know we can do this for psoriasis uh, by targeting a single cytokine and really changing people's lives. The problem is psoriasis drugs don't work for vitiligo. And so we had to identify the pathway that drives vitiligo uh, so that we could develop targeted treatments for it. And to do that, we, we really integrate uh, a, a uh, wide, broad treatment uh, research strategy where we, we do basic science in a mouse model of vitiligo. We, we do translational research in patient tissues, and we also run clinical trials. We really work to seamlessly integrate that whole process to make uh, new clinically relevant discoveries. And so starting with our mouse model, uh, this is how we, we give mice vitiligo. Uh, we take a, a mouse that has black skin and black hair. This is a transgenic mouse that express, uh, expresses um, kit ligand or, or stem cell factor in keratinocytes that retains the melanocytes in the skin. We adoptively transfer CD8 T cells from a T cell transgenic mouse that, that targets GP100 or, or melanocyte specific antigen. And we activate those cells uh, in, in, in the host with vaccinia virus that expresses their antigen. So that stimulates the cells, causes them to proliferate and, uh, and migrate around the mouse. And they migrate into the skin and kill the melanocytes. So they cause these white spots, uh, as you can see here on the tail, on the, the, the foot. It also occurs on the nose and the ear. And so the first thing we did was we, we really wanted to understand the gene expression profile in the skin uh, in vitiligo lesions. So this is uh, looking at both human and mouse skin um, with vitiligo, the, the human is black bars, the mouse is white. And you can see a clear loss of melanocytes uh, as you'd expect in vitiligo. But then there's really a focused interferon gamma signature. So you can see interferon gamma is induced, interferon gamma induced genes are expressed. And there's nothing representative of a type 17 signature or type two. Um, this is important because we've got great biologics that target IL-17 and IL-23 and TNF-alpha, as well as uh, dupilumab that targets IL-4 and 13. And the, this is why they don't work for vitiligo. They're targeting uh, pathways that just are not involved. And in fact, these, these biologics can induce and exacerbate vitiligo. So we hypothesized that interferon gamma was playing a, a major role in driving disease. 
And that turned out to be true in our mouse model. If we knocked out interferon gamma, we could protect them from vitiligo. Uh, and downstream of interferon gamma, this is CXCL10, a highly expressed gene. Uh, we found that if we knocked that out, we could also prevent vitiligo. This is Mady Rishigi, one of my um, research postdoctoral fellows in the lab, who is now one of our faculty and running his own research program. <clears throat> Um, so we found that CXCL10 and interferon gamma was required for vitiligo to occur. And even more importantly, we found that if we targeted CXCL10 uh, after vitiligo formed, this used to be a black tail and now it's white. Uh, if, we, if we then targeted it at this point, we could reverse vitiligo. And you can see nice perifollicular repigmentation like we see in, in humans repigmenting this tail. Uh, and so this was a little surprising to us actually that, that targeting the pathway not only prevented but also reversed but it was exciting because this meant that this could be a new treatment for vitiligo. So this is a quick summary of what I just told you. CD8 T cells come in, they recognize melanocytes and make interferon gamma. That actually induces the keratinocytes to make CXCL10 and recruits more T cells from the blood through CXCR3 to target and kill these cells. So interferon gamma <clears throat> signals through its receptor, JAX1 and 2, STAT1, and chemokine CXCL9 and 10, as I mentioned, in their receptor CXCR3. So in the mouse model, we knocked out the majority uh, of these components of interferon gamma signaling and showed that that prevented vitiligo. In addition, we, we used antibodies to target uh, other uh, extracellular, either secreted or receptor uh, proteins, and, and we found that this prevented and reversed vitiligo. And then we also found that JAK inhibitors were able to prevent and reverse vitiligo in our mouse model. Maybe more importantly than that is that JAK inhibitors work in humans. So uh, Brett King published the first uh, case report showing that tofacitinib was effective at reversing vitiligo in a patient. You can see a nice response here. Uh, we published a, a paper with a Cristiano group uh, in New York uh, with a pa patient that we treated with oral ruxolitinib, and you can see a great response here um, before and after uh, four months of five months of treatment, um, excellent repigmentation of his face. And in addition, we had saved up his serum for over a year. And this is CXCL10 level. It's, it's highly elevated in this patient and stable for over a year. And as soon as he started taking ruxolitinib, that level dropped precipitously. So this really told us not only were JAK inhibitors effective at treating vitiligo, but they seem to be working the way we'd hypothesized by blocking interferon gamma and reducing downstream chemokines. Then David Rosemarin tested uh, topical ruxolitinib to treat uh, about 11 patients with vitiligo and showed that that was also very effective, particularly on the face. And, and so these studies together really provided the rationale to start clinical trials to test JAK inhibitors in vitiligo. This is Zenab uh, Abbas, and she was one of our clinical fellows who helped us run the clinical trials. She's now one of our dermatology residents. Um, and I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about the, the results from the INSIGHT clinical trial um, as we just published uh, this phase two study. So this was a phase two trial to test ruxolitinib cream to treat vitiligo, randomized, placebo controlled. Um, <clears throat> we randomized uh, patients for the first six months to a number of different doses of the drug, including uh, placebo control. And then for the second six months of the year, the placebo was re-randomized to a higher dose of drug uh, to get benefit of treatment. And then for the following year, for the second year, all patients received the highest dose of drug uh, in an open label study. And this, these are the results. So this is showing the uh, VASI 50, which is a 50% improvement in the vitiligo, uh, specifically on the face here. And you can see <clears throat> within six months, about half the patients achieved a VASI 50 on their face, and this was maintained for a full year. And not just on the face, but now the total body, which is a lot harder to treat because there's a lower density of hair on the body compared to the face. You can see still after a year, almost half of the patients were able to achieve uh, the total VASI 50. When we raise the bar uh, to a VASI 75 and 90, you can see that after a year, 50% of patients were achieving even a VASI 75 on the face, um, and, and a third of the patients were achieving a VASI 90 with, with really beautiful outcomes. Patients were very happy with this response, and this was, this was pretty impressive. Reminding me really of the early studies uh, 20 to 25 years ago, um, maybe even 30 years ago now uh, in, in psoriasis patients, where there was a, a, a PASI 50 in about 40% of the patients, and that was really exciting. 
All right, so this is just an example. This is one of my favorite pictures of a patient who was randomized to placebo for the first six months. She didn't improve. She actually got a little bit worse um, and, and then was re-randomized to one of the higher doses of the drug. And you can see within six months, she repigmented um, almost completely. Um, and so she was, she was very happy with this. In addition, I mentioned this works on the elbow. Uh, it, here's the elbow, it works on the body as well. So you can see a nice response after six weeks or six, um, six months of treatment with topical rexolitinib as well. And it was really well tolerated. So uh, the only adverse event that was reported specific to drug compared to placebo was acne. So about 10 to 15% of patients using topical rexolitinib developed acne in the local area where it was applied. And this resolved uh, quickly after it was discontinued and, and patients tolerated this well. They didn't drop out of the trial because of this event. However, I don't know how many people recognized in my earlier slide that um, when the patient was stopped on ruxolitinib here at week 20, within three months, he'd lost almost all of the pigment that he had gained. Uh, and so ruxolitinib, oral ruxolitinib and JAK inhibitors do not appear to be uh, a durable treatment for vitiligo. Uh, this shouldn't be too surprising. Most treatments that are discontinued, uh, the, the, the disease comes back and relapses. And so treatments need to be maintained long-term. And, and Thierry Passeron published a paper in 2015 really describing this. He showed that if you take a bunch of patients with vitiligo and make them better and then stop their treatment, about 40 or 40% 40 of them relapse within the first year of stopping treatment. And this can be decreased by uh, using tacrolimus uh, as a maintenance therapy twice weekly uh, to under 10%. But what was interesting to us, not only as a clinician that patients relapse, is scientifically that patients seem to relapse in the exact same location they had vitiligo before. So this is one of my patients who had a beautiful response to Naraband UVB. Um, she uh, had a pregnancy and stopped her, her therapy for a year and a half and she relapsed. And, and specifically it came back right in the exact same location. She had lots of vitiligo on her abdomen previously and this is the first place it showed up again. And so we wanted to know scientifically why does vitiligo relapse in the same place it was before? Uh, rather than just somewhere else in the body. And this really told us that there was probably some form of immune memory, uh, autoimmune memory that was forming in lesions when vitiligo forms so that it remembers where to go uh, if treatment has ever stopped. And so we and three other labs from around the world hypothesized that the relapse was due to a type of uh, memory CD8 T cell called resident memory T cells. And essentially, they were first described in the context of viral infection, where CD8 T cells will go in, clear the virus in the skin, uh, and then leave some cells behind after most of them clear out, um, just in case that virus ever comes back. And those, those cells that were left behind are called resident memory T cells, as they, they don't recirculate in the blood very much, um, and they, they're retained in the epidermis. And so this is Jillian here. I told you I'd be showing a lot of her data. Um, and Jillian really kind of wanted to know um, again, why the like relapses is it due to resident memory T cells, and she was able to easily find them uh, both in our, in our patients and, and in our mouse model. So this is uh, blood from PBMCs from, from patients with vitiligo, and we're using pentamer staining. So this is, uh, pentamers are loaded with melanocyte antigen, and so they stick to cells that recognize melanocytes. So you can see a small population of CD8s in the blood are, are specific for melanocytes, about half a percent. But in the lesions, this is enriched pretty significantly. So here we're showing about 50% of the, the lesional T cells uh, are melanocyte specific. And if you look at an active lesion where there are a lot of cells, you can see uh, about 40% of them are becoming resident memory cells uh, currently. Um, but in a stable lesion where there aren't very many cells left and only a few cells left behind, those are all resident memory. And so they, they have this phenotype of being CD103 positive, CD69 positive. These are classic markers of resident memory. There are now others, CD49A and, and others. Uh, these are the ones that we use to identify them. And if you looked in the mouse model, uh, which is uh, a synchronized model of the LIGO, where we can take them down over a course of disease, you can see at week three, very early on, uh, again, a proportion are becoming resident memory. And this increases over time until disease is stabilized and the majority have this phenotype. So this, this is a quick summary of that, where uh, I already showed you the progression of vitiligo here, this positive feedback loop. 
but then a proportion of these cells can actually convert to resident memory. They go up into the epidermis and glue themselves in, in case melanocytes attempt to repigment the skin and grow back, and they engage them, uh, and then make interferon gamma, again, turn on the chemokine uh, uh, secretion and recruit more effector memory cells from the blood to then come in and kill the cells. And, and so this is really the progression of vitiligo, and this is responsible for the maintenance and relapse of disease. And relapse comes because conventional treatments and JAK inhibitors can inhibit the function of resident memory T cells. And because these can't function and are put to sleep, essentially the melanocytes can repigment the skin and make everything look clinically normal. But when the, the treatments are stopped, these cells wake back up and, and reinitiate the whole process in the exact same location it was before. And to test this in the mouse, this hypothesis in the mouse, uh, this is uh, Vincent, who is an MD-PhD student in the lab, now is one of our medical students, uh, MD-PhD students, uh, sorry, he was an undergrad in the lab, he's now one of our MD-PhD students. And he took the mice and treated them with tofacitinib and ruxolitinib and showed that we were able to, to repigment the mice with JAK inhibitors uh, to a pretty strong extent. But importantly, the resident memory T cells were unaffected by this treatment. So even though the mice got better, the resident memory T cells were still there in, in, in essentially normal numbers. And, and so this did not clear them out. And, and so this really explains why the treatments were able to be effective, but not durable. Um, the resident memory T cells are still there. They wake back up and reinitiate disease. So the other thing Jillian uh, was asking was whether we can selectively deplete these cells. Can we get rid of resident memory T cells uh, as a treatment for vitiligo? Not only would this uh, presumably make vitiligo better, but it might keep it better uh, and prevent relapse because that memory has been erased in the skin. So I had a chance meeting uh, at a Gordon conference with Tom Gebhardt, who was presenting this data um, a, a number of years ago, showing, studying resident memory T cells uh, in, in the context of viral infection and showing that they really depend on IL-15, not only for their early formation, but for long-term maintenance. In the absence of IL-15, these cells don't, don't survive long-term. And so we thought that maybe this could be the Achilles heel of resident memory T cells that we could target as a treatment for vitiligo. So long story short, Jillian showed that that was true and it worked. We used an antibody against IL-15 receptor beta chain uh, that blocks IL-15 signaling by targeting the receptor. And we saw very nice repigmentation, um, probably more than I've seen with other therapies. And uh, maybe just as importantly, we saw that that depleted resident memory T cells from the skin. And so we hypothesized that this would be a much longer lasting treatment. We tested that by, uh, treating the mice just for two weeks, short-term treatment. We found that they repigmented for two months uh, long-term. And then we found that we didn't even need to inject the, the antibody systemically, but we could inject it just into the skin, into the tail skin. Uh, we injected it for four weeks and then saw uh, repigmentation for three months. And, and so this was really um, supporting the idea that we could target IL-15 signaling as a therapy for vitiligo that might be durable and long-lasting. And so IL-15 signaling is, is rather complex. This is a keratinocyte uh, that's making both IL-15 and the alpha chain of the receptor for IL-15. And essentially what this results in is the keratinocyte holding the cytokine in the epidermis uh, called transpresentation. It essentially retains IL-15 secretion in the epidermis. So when a T cell enters the epidermis, all of a sudden they see this high level of IL-15. This is the T cell sensing the IL-15 through the IL-15 receptor beta chain and the common gamma chain. And essentially this sends a signal through JAX1 and 3 and, and uh, of retention and survival in the skin. So we hypothesized that we could target this as a therapy for vitiligo. And uh, so I applied for a grant uh, to the Immune Tolerance Network at the NIH uh, to, to do this. And we received it and given the approval, Amgen has a drug that an antibody that targets the cytokine IL-15. So we proposed to, to launch a clinical trial this, to, to test this. Um, and I, we wrote the protocol and got things moving, but I had to recuse myself from this trial um, because I was approached by venture capital uh, given the opportunity to start our own company called Valeris Therapeutics with uh, Series A financing to develop a, uh, a drug against the receptor. Um, this is what we did, we used in the mice. We actually think targeting the receptor beta chain is, is a much better approach. IL-15 is very highly expressed throughout um, all tissues of the body. And, and so it's very difficult to, uh, to, to saturate 
IL-15 with antibody to block the signaling. Uh, I think you can do it partially, um, but, but the receptor is expressed only on T cells and NK cells. And so it's a much smaller pool and, and easier to saturate this and block signaling. Um, and, and so actually this, this clinical trial is, is ongoing. Uh, I, Brett King is the, is the PI now running this trial. I believe he's recruiting even. And, um, and, and we're continuing to develop our, our drug, we're hoping to get um, into clinical trials soon. So really exciting. Those are the two pathways targeting interferon gamma signaling with JAK inhibitors. Um, let's see here, uh, interferon gamma signaling with JAK inhibitors. Potentially you could use CXCR3 or CXCL10 antibodies or interferon gamma as well. Um, and then also potentially targeting IL-15 signaling as a, as a potentially better and more durable uh, approach uh, to treating vitiligo. So next, I want to talk uh, about how we use skin blistering for translational research. This really changed uh, the direction of my lab. Initially, we were focusing mostly on uh, basic science and our, and our mouse model. And, and I was always, always kind of felt I couldn't get enough cells out of the skin with a punch biopsy. Um, I never knew where to punch uh, because vitiligo can be stable and, and you just don't know where the T cells are. Um, and so knowing where to biopsy is, is really a challenge. And, and Jim Strassner, who was an MD-PhD student in the lab of, uh, at the time, helped me to develop this technique um, that actually has been around for decades. Uh, blistering uh, has been, been around for a long time, used at the NIH to study contact dermatitis. Um, Jim is now back. Uh, he's defended his thesis. He's back in the clinical years. He's a, a fourth year med student now, uh, actually applying to dermatology. And, and, and this is Maggie Ahmed from Egypt, who is a dermatologist and came to work with us and do research for a number of years. And, and, and this is Van Kim, who is an undergrad uh, and looking to go to medical school. And this, this is really our, our our uh, fantastic team who blisters patients uh, and, and develop this technique. So this is my foot. Uh, these are three blisters on my foot. I, I can testify that it is uh, painless um, and, and uh, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes. We use a negative pressure machine and some uh, LED lights to heat the skin. And 30 to 40 minutes later, we develop these blisters, which we can then sample uh, using a syringe and, and pull out the fluid. The blister forms at the dermal epidermal junction where the, the cells are in vitiligo and uh, gives us a great opportunity to, to sample the skin. So this is a patient who's being blistered, very comfortable. Uh, this is Jillian. Uh, and, and so here's her foot and you can see that there are tiny little macules of depigmentation here. We call this confetti vitiligo. And it really is an indicator, a, a sign that this is active disease. When you have tiny little spots within a short period of time, they'll all coalesce into a much larger patch. And so this is an opportunity for us to know that the T cells are in there. We position the, the, uh, the negative pressure blistering head uh, with holes over these spots. So we sample lesional and perilesional skin where the T cells are. We don't have to know exactly where the T cells are because this is a one centimeter blister and draws fluid from a large area. And so it's more like tossing a hand grenade than, than, than in, in, in the fact that you just have to get close to a lesion and the, the T cells will be sucked in. This is the, the blisters afterward where we can go in and, and pull the fluid out with a syringe. You can see that they formed. And we always do blistering on a, on a non-lesional area for comparison, because um, certainly blistering itself could, could cause some trauma to the skin and, and changes in the skin. And so we control for that by always looking at non-lesional skin. And so this is how we use it. Uh, I mentioned we, use, we look at lesional, non-lesional skin. We also sample healthy control skin for comparison. And in that fluid are cells and proteins and metabolites. We can take the cells uh, and, and analyze them by flow cytometry or single cell RNA sequencing. I'll talk about some of that data. Um, we can take the fluid and analyze that by ELISA for proteins or pr proteomics, which is broad uh, screening for proteins and even metabolomics as well. And so I will uh, tell you about uh, first about using flow cytometry in ELISA. This is published data that, that Jim was first author on where we looked at uh, active vitiligo patients and stable patients as well as some healthy controls. We found that CD8 T cells by flow cytometry uh, are, are significantly elevated in active lesional skin um, and, and not in non-lesional skin. So this is really a good indicator that non-lesional skin is a good control. We're, we're blistering far away from the lesional skin. So elevated CD8 T cells were not too much of a surprise, but this is pretty significant difference. 
CXCL9 protein in the blister fluid by ELISA also uh, turned out to be a significant difference. And this was very sensitive and specific marker uh, of active lesional skin in vitiligo. We also found in collaboration with Amit Pandya, my friend uh, who at the time was in Dallas and now is in San Francisco, but we treated patients before and after treatment, or, or we sampled patients before and after treatment um, for uh, analysis of these markers. So this is uh, about four weeks of treatment of narrowband UVB, systemic steroids and topical steroids. And you can see that the CD8 T cells are significantly reduced in four weeks. The CXCL9 protein becomes almost undetectable after four weeks. And this is significant because this is way before you see any clinical response of therapy. So that takes at least three months to start to see a response. And so these are really great early biomarkers of treatment response. And, and we've used them in, in a couple of uh, clinical trials, including Insight and Dermavan for this purpose. So then we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. We'd used these techniques to validate kind of what we'd already found. And we thought um, since we'd, we'd really worked in depth on two or three pathways in vitiligo, really understanding what their role is in pathogenesis, we thought that there are probably many, many, many more pathways at work that coordinate inflammation during vitiligo. And so we wanted to use single cell RNA sequencing uh, to, to, to try to identify uh, all of the pathways and, and some of the rarer ones that might not show up using conventional uh, assays. So this, many of you are familiar with what single cell is, but just to, to for those who aren't, um, whole tissue gene expression profiling essentially just takes a plug of skin. This is a punch biopsy with all, all the different cells that are in there. It essentially turns it into a smoothie. Uh, and then we analyze that smoothie for what genes are being expressed. And so that actually is, is a good technique. This is how we, we identified interferon gamma as a major player here. But once we're here, we can't reconstruct what happened in the skin. We don't know where these uh, proteins are being made, our transcripts are being made, what cell types make them. We probably lose a lot of transcripts that get diluted in here um, if they're not in a, in a highly popula pop, uh, populous cell population. And so a better way um, to approach this and, and to really look at individual cells within the lesion is through single cell profile. And so this is Manuel Garber. Uh, one of my close collaborators and, a, and an amazing uh, computational biologist here at UMass. He really is a, is a leader in analyzing uh, genome sequencing and RNA sequencing. And so we take the fluid mixed up with lots of cells here and we put it through a microfluidics platform. This is Indrop, which essentially requires one cell at a time to go through the, the, uh, the tube and get paired up with a bead that has uh, primers for, for single cell RNA sequencing. And, and they get put together in a droplet, and then we can um, uh, reverse transcribe the RNA into cDNA and then sequence that. And essentially what that does is it takes the bowl of fruit, and instead of turning it into a smoothie, just organizes it. And we can see what's in there and, uh, and, and dig a little bit deeper. So um, this is uh, Jake Galatly and, and again, Jim. Together, they work together to, to really put together this uh, data along with our collaborator, Manuel. Uh, Jake is Manuel's student. And, and so we looked at tens of thousands of cells, and, and this is just a heat map of individual cells and the genes they're expressing and, and kind of um, sorting them into groups. And you can see that we see a lot of different cell types here from the blisters. We expected to get T cells, uh, but we were really surprised to see uh, lots and lots of keratinocytes, even melanocytes that are the target during vitiligo. Um, and, and we could even see differentiated uh, keratinocytes, so basal keratinocytes based on keratin 110 expression and spinous keratinocytes on, on um, carat, uh, keratin, uh, sorry, basal based on 5 and 14, spinous based on 1 and 10, uh, keratin 2 marks granular keratinocytes. We saw macrophages on K cells. We could even split the T cells into T regs and T conventional cells and CD8 T cells and saw dendritic cells. So lots of cells came out of this blister. Um, and, and what this indicated was that the blister roof, which is the epidermis, really gets pulled apart into a single cell suspension. And this is why we're able to collect keratinocytes and melanocytes and, and uh, longer hunt cells as well. So we're really excited by this. Again, we got a lot more than we, we, we expected. And so this is a T-SNE plot that many of you are probably familiar with, clustering the cells based on their, their expression profile uh, similarities. And here are the basal keratinocytes and then the spinous keratinocytes and the granular. Uh, this is, they're organized based on their differentiation state. We see dendritic cells, including longer hunt cells, macrophages, melanocytes themselves. 
a large population of lymphocytes that split into uh, two groups, activated or, uh, or uh, unactivated cells. And those cells can then be um, redistributed into subgroups. And, and here's where we are able to identify the CD8 T cells. These are CD4s that split to T conventional and T regs, gamma delta T cells and NK cells. Um, so we're excited to see all of these populations and start to ask what their um, expression profiles look like. So the first thing we wanted to know was receptor ligand connections because receptors and ligands are uh, excellent targets for therapy um, because they're extracellular. So we went to a, a database that had listed all of the ligands and receptors expressed in the human genome. We looked at those that were uh, differentially expressed in our data. And, and one thing that fell out of this, uh, the columns here are uh, individual cell types in the skin. We can see these are, this is healthy, non-lesional and lesional skin and, 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 and all the genes that are expressed. And, and one of the things that we were surprised to find was that both ligands and receptors were very cell type specific. So you can see that most ligands are only expressed by one cell type in the skin and most receptors also only expressed by one cell type. That was surprising because we thought that a ligand might be expressed by a lot of different types of cells and the receptors by a lot of different types and essentially vitiligo conversations were essentially cells yelling at other cells in, in, a, in a really loud um, uh, disorganized manner. And, and what this tells us really is that Conversations in vitiligo are very specific between two, two cell types. They're very private conversations between a dendritic cell and a macrophage, for example, or a T cell and a keratinocyte or a melanocyte. And, and so we can take these unidirectional private conversations and build them into a network of cell types talking to other cell types where, where the, the dot is a cell type, uh, the, the edges here, the lines are uh, a, a ligand receptor pair, and we can connect them into a large network and start to organize that network. And, and you can see chemotaxis plays a prominent role in the network, as you'd expect, as we've already kind of learned. Class 1 MHC is highly upregulated, and there's some other interesting network uh, pieces that fall out. So we wanted to dig deeper into chemotaxis because that's kind of what we know well. Um, and, and we can target that therapeutically. And so we, we looked even closer at all of the chemokines and the receptors in our data. And here we're showing a heat map of each chemokine and which cell it's expressed and whether it's up or down regulated, as well as its receptor, same, same thing. And we can look to see who's communicating to whom, um, specifically in, in, again, healthy, non-lesional and lesional uh, skin. And one of the things that we first saw that was very obvious was CXCL9 and 10 again, signaling through their receptor CXCR3. So this, this we've done already done a lot of work on. We saw this even without single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and, uh, and, and this validated the data set to, to give us confidence that this, this was, uh, uh, data was, was good. Here you can see CXCR3 on the CD8 T cells as we described, CXCL9 and 10 expressed by, we're a little surprised it was strongly expressed by macrophages and dendritic cells, but also keratinocytes as we expected. We focused a little more on uh, CCL5 and CCR5. So CCL5, uh, we found, was expressed highly by CD8 T cells. And we saw CCR5 was expressed on CD8s, but also on Tregs, and that this was highly upregulated on Tregs, which we were a little surprised by. Um, and, and we didn't know what it was doing. So Tregs, if, if CCR5 is being upregulated, this could mean, well, it's in lesional skin and they're upregulating it, means that they're not very effective anymore, and that defines it as lesional skin. Or it could mean they're upregulating CCR5 to try to control the inflammation that's not being controlled there. So CCR5 could either be helping Tregs suppress or preventing them from suppressing. And we wanted to know which one of those that was. So here's the data just uh, closer up again, the single cell data showing Tregs upregulating CCR5. We wanted to look uh, by protein. So we, we used blistering and flow cytometry, uh, identified Tregs by FOXP3 CD25 staining. And we could identify that most of the Tregs actually expressed some CCR5. But importantly, uh, Tregs actually upregulated the levels of CCR, CCR5. So this is the MFI, the mean fluorescence intensity going up in lesions. So Tregs are, are expressing much more CCR5 in lesional skin. And this is consistent with uh, the transcriptional data. We looked in mice. Uh, so this is Kingsley. And Kingsley's, Kingsley's project was really to dig deep into Tregs and CCR5. Um, in our mouse model. And he found that uh, CCR5 was upregulated on, uh, on, on Tregs in the lymph nodes and 
in the skin of mice with vitiligo specifically. Again, the MFI was highly upregulated, showing that this was consistent with what we saw in our patients. So next, he just looked at Treg function in our mouse model. Uh, other mouse models had already shown that Tregs probably suppress disease, uh, but they were it was shown kind of in a general way by depleting CD4 T cells. Here, we wanted to deplete only Tregs and see what happened. And so we used a FOXP3 DTR mouse that expresses diphtheria toxin only on Tregs, gave the mice diphtheria toxin to deplete the Tregs, uh, and we found that um, mice not depleted in Tregs got normal disease. But when the Tregs were depleted, we got a significant um, increase in severity and disease. And this is an example of mice with Tregs and mice without Tregs on the ears. We wanted to look at Treg function uh, on, on, a, on a specific cell basis. And so to do this, we wanted to be able to transfer in Tregs into a model. So we used uh, our mouse model with black skin uh, that were RAG knockout, so no T cells. And we put the CD8s in there uh, with or without Tregs. And we found that without Tregs, the CD8s cause significant disease, particularly on the ears, as you can see here. And when we co-transferred Tregs, we could suppress that pretty significantly. And so Tregs were functioning uh, to restrain vitiligo in our mouse model. And again, no Tregs with Tregs. So next, we wanted to see what the Tregs were doing. Where were they localizing? How were they interacting with CD8 T cells? And so we used uh, host mice that express FOXP3 GFP, so the Tregs were green, and we adoptively transferred in red uh, RFP CD8 T cells. And we could see that uh, by, by uh, confocal imaging, we could see that the cells were distributing together, uh, really kind of clustering together in the ear skin of the mice, where both red and green cells are here and here. Um, and when, when we actually looked at very high resolution, we could see they weren't just clustering together, but they were actually appeared to be interacting. So we can see red cells reaching out and touching green cells here, um, showing the Tregs and the CD8 T cells um, really making it, it, it an intentional attempt to interact. So Kingsley wanted to know what this looked like in humans. Uh, so we took human biopsies of vitiligo, active vitiligo, and we actually saw the exact same profile. So now here we're staining for FOXP3, uh, with, with green and CD8 with red and CCR5 with blue. And you can see here's a cluster of cells, again, similar to what we find over here, um, with lots of CD8 T cells in red and the green T regs are distributing with them. And, and actually you can see this reach out uh, and, and interaction here in a number of places. And here's a blow up of that. So you can see the T reg and the CD8 reaching out to touch the T reg. Um, and importantly, the T regs are, are producing CCR5. So you can see that here. Here's another example um, up at the top where you've got a Treg expressing CCR5 interacting with a, a CD8 T cell. So the mouse and the human uh, looking very similar. So the next step was to adoptively transfer in either wild type Tregs, which as we saw in the RAG model, um, reduces disease significantly. But when we used CCR5 knockout Tregs, we saw that they were not able to suppress as well as wild types. And so CCR5 was required for Tregs to suppress vitiligo. Um, but so the, the, the original thought was this is probably just what's recruiting them into the skin, that, that CCR5 is required to get Tregs into the skin. And that, so the first thing we looked at in our mouse model was, was Tregs in the skin either wild type or CCR5 knockout. And clearly there was no deficiency. Uh, this is the lymph node, but, but this is in the ear skin um, and the tail skin. The CCR5 knockout Tregs were actually getting in there just fine and, and actually maybe even a little bit more than the wild types. So there was certainly no deficiency in Tregs able to localize to the skin. We looked at this again in, in, a, in a more, uh, maybe more rigorous way where we, we required the two to compete with each other. Wild type Tregs were co-transferred with knockout Tregs into our model. And you can see in the lymph node, they were at normal numbers, uh, equal numbers. And really in the, uh, in the ear skin and in the tail skin, we saw no significant changes, no, no real difficult uh, difference in the ability of CCR5 knockout Tregs to make it to skin, which was surprising because this was kind of, what we, what we thought would be the, the main mechanism of CCR5 and Treg function. But <clears throat> when we use confocal imaging, we actually saw that um, here again, you see these clusters. Now we're looking at green wild type Tregs and red knockout Tregs. And you can see the green wild types clustering as we saw previously. We're not seeing CD8 T cells now. 
but uh, the red T regs are not making it into these clusters for some reason. So essentially, it appears to be a localization defect of the knockout T regs rather than a bulk recruitment to the skin. And so we're still working on this. Um, there's more more to be done. Here's just another uh, higher power, and and so. What, what we understand right now is Tregs do not require CCL5 to get into the skin, uh, but once they're there, they need it to localize with CD8 T cells. And, and so then there's this interaction that's required. We'd love to know exactly why they need to interact uh, physically in order for suppression to occur. Um, but when we build this now onto what we what we talked about before, maybe discovered the role of CXCL10 in interfering gamma and vitiligo. This can be targeted with JAK inhibitors. Uh, Jillian worked on uh, the role of IL-15 in resident memory and why um, vitiligo is maintained in relapses. And then again, uh, Kingsley and, and uh, looking at the functional data with CCR5 and Tregs, as well as the single cell RNA sequencing that led us there. All right, so um, just a couple more slides here. Proteomics and metabolomics we're looking into, still very preliminary data. We used O-Link to look at uh, over a thousand proteins in the blister fluid. Um, we found CXCL9 and 10 again. So this we love seeing these guys because it really validates our data and tells us that, that the, the assay worked. Um, we're looking at metabolomics, which is a new field for us, um, but we see metabolites highly upregulated in lesional skin and also some that are highly downregulated. And so we're, we'd love to tie the proteomics, the metabolomics, and the single cell transcriptomics to understand really the, uh, the coordinated effort, uh, coordination and cellular communications that's required to drive vitiligo. Um, just kind of as a as funny aside at the end here, just how we look at data. So I'm a, I'm a dermatologist, as many of you are. I like to see it with my eyes uh, visually. And, and um, it's funny because I work with collaborators who are computational biologists and we look at the data very differently. So um, this, is, uh, this is our studio, how the data is analyzed and this is the problem. So I'm not very good at this, I, I can do it. I can pluck away and look at a couple genes here and there. Um, but this is how Jake will analyze the data to send it to me. So here's a bunch of lists, uh, differential expression, uh, cell types, and this is essentially how the data appears. Um, and and I, 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 my eyes cross at this. I really can't dig much out of this. I need to see it visually. And so I went to Jake uh, and said, Jake, guys, can you make me a heat map of the DE list? I need to see a heat map. And he said, why? And I said, I want to print it out. And of course, Jake in his head, nice, kindly is saying, well, that's kind of dumb. And, and Manuel said, literally said this on paper, that would be over six feet long. Uh, and so me, uh, I actually printed it. It was. It turned out to be 13 feet long. Uh, but this is a heat map of the data. And I actually walk in. This is one of our conference rooms here. And I walk into this room and just stare at this heat map and find things that I think are interesting. Uh, this is kind of how I sort through the data. Um, probably not very efficient, but it's a whole lot of fun. Here's our ligand and receptor data I told you about. Here are proteomics. This is just the top five pages of 15 pages of proteomics and our metabolomics over here uh, and some interesting candidates up at the top. So. It's been a ton of fun. Um, we're, we're working closely with Manuel Garber and, and his group to do the single cell RNA sequencing and, and other omics integration. Um, Amit Pandey is a collaborator. These are the guys that do all the work. Uh, I actually uh, I don't use pipettes anymore. Um, this is just such a dynamic and fantastic team, all the way from undergrads who are interested in going to medical school to dermatologists from other countries who are joining us. Um, and, and everybody in between, fellows and postdocs and, and grad students and MD-PhD students. Uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of fun. And, and we have people who are presenting clinical trial data in lab meeting, followed by someone presenting the, the mouse model and what that exact same drug is doing in the mouse. And, and so it really gives us a lot of insight and allows us to make um, strong conclusions, I think, um, that are clinically relevant in a, me in a mechanistic way. So uh, that's it. I, I did it in uh, 45 minutes and I'm happy to take questions if there's time. That was awesome, John, thank you. Um, we have a first question from Maria Teresa. She says, this was great, thank you. Are there any hypotheses on why the CD8s affect certain skin locations more frequently? Yeah, that, I get asked that question a lot and I'll warn you ahead of time that nobody is ever happy with my answer. Um, so th there are kind of a couple questions there. Number one, it, it's pretty symmetric um, 
it tends to affect the left side and the right side equally, but but then um, is, is a bit unpredictable in who's going to get a lesion where. Um, the other thing, though, is if you look at a large population, people tend to get lesions on their face and their hands more and their genitals more commonly than other parts of the body. And so we don't know the reason why. I, I think that um, generally some of it is, is kind of a random distribution of T-cells. So they're, they're, the T-cell number is a bottleneck. It's limiting. And if you take a few T-cells and scatter them on somebody's body, um, they'll, they'll, there are only a few locations will, will start until they're able to proliferate and involve more of the body. Um, they also, for some reason, prefer the face and the hands, uh, and we don't know the reason for that. I tend to think that it has something to do with melanocyte density in those locations. Those are the most dense areas of melanocytes on the body. Um, and then why there's, it's symmetric, I think, would be predictable. If you take a number of cells and you throw them at a wall and, and, and they, they tend to go to the magnets, for example, and they tend to go to certain areas, then the distribution on the left and the right would be relatively the same. Um, so I think it's a mix of, for some reason, T cells preferring certain locations of the body, but, but not only those locations, uh, a random association of limited cells to initiate disease, and then this distribution that affects the left and the right equally simply because of, uh, of random kind of association. And now you see why nobody's ever happy with that explanation. There's a lot of work to be done to really get a better answer. Yep. Um, thank you. So we have another question from Kanan. She says, as a vitiligo sufferer with a toddler who has also inherited the disease, I want to first thank you for all of your efforts here. I find the science fascinating and exciting. In the event that IL-15 receptor blockade is successful in humans, do you have a sense that this approach would succeed in repigmenting areas where hair is absent? And if not, is there an approach that you believe would succeed in, repig in repigmenting those stubborn areas that could be used in conjunction with IL-15 blockade? Yeah, the, the fact that some areas of the body don't repigment is really frustrating for, for many patients um, and, and for us as clinicians. So, you know, if a patient comes in with facial vitiligo and hand vitiligo, I can say, great news, I can repigment your face almost guaranteed 100%, and I probably won't be able to affect your hands very much. Uh, and, and that's both happy because of the face, but sad because of the hands. Um, it's really the hair follicles that we think provide the opportunity for repigmentation. Um, and, and so if there aren't any hair follicles, there aren't stem cells. And we think that the, the classic immunosuppressant therapies probably won't be too effective. Now, we don't know that for sure. It's possible that, you know, uh, in areas that don't repigment where there are some hairs, it's possible that resident memory is forming in the hair and that blocking IL-15 will actually release that. And therefore, um, some stubborn areas will respond to IL-15, but, but it's also possible that it's not. We're actually working um, on, on some, some new ideas that we think may repigment uh, the, the glabrous skin, like the hands and the feet um, and the wrists. Uh, and, and so that, that's not ready for game time, but, but we're working on it. Nice. Um, now we have a question from Daniel. He says, thank you for your presentation. Um, going back to the beginning of the talk, do you envision a combo therapy with IL-15 receptor inhibition and JAK inhibitors, or do you think IL-15 inhibition would be sufficient to treat vitiligo? And we're hoping IL-15 is going to be sufficient. Um, so the idea is when we block IL-15, uh, the, the, the memory cells leave the skin. And, and so the, the initial thought um, that J Jillian and I had was the initial thought was, we'll get them out of the skin. They'll still be in the spleen and the lymph nodes, and, and they can always reform a new lesion. But that takes a long time. It takes years to decades uh, for a new lesion to form. So we thought if we just block IL-15, we won't necessarily cure them, um, but, but we'll give them long-term remission. And, and if it ever comes back, we'll just give them IL-15 inhibition again. But what we found that we were both surprised by was that when we blocked, uh, when we gave IL-15 antibody, um, we saw a depletion not only of the, the skin uh, autoreactive cells, but the cells in the lymph nodes and the spleen and the blood as well. Um, and that was a little bit surprising and maybe concerning because now if you just deplete all your T cells, that's not necessarily safe. But the other follow-up that we found was blocking IL-15 only affected the autoreactive cells in those locations and did not affect the normal T cells in those spots. We, d we still don't know why for sure that is, but um, the, the short, of, short of it is that IL-15 blockade only depleted autoreactive cells, um, not the normal ones. So it appeared to be relatively safe. Um, and it, it, it got the autoreactive cells in all locations. So maybe it could be curative. We, we don't know until we test it. Yeah, that, that question still bugs me, actually. I want to know why, 
why they had a higher MFI of IL-15 receptor. It's really interesting, like the biology, so. Yeah, the, um, and so that that's that's a good point. We did see that they, they express higher levels of the IL-15 receptor, the autoreactive ones, which kind of answers the question probably why were the only those targeted, but why do they express high levels of IL-15? Is it because that it's, it's self-antigen and therefore it's it's a it, it's not a strong antigen. It's a moderate antigen, or is it because the antigen is around all the time and never gets fully cleared? Um, those are good questions we don't have the answer to. We have another question from Kanan. Uh, if I'm understanding the approach correctly, it seems that by targeting IL-15 receptor, you're mitigating some at-large risks to the immune system as a whole that could potentially be revealed in the Amgen study. For the layperson, uh, what is the role of IL-15 as it concerns system outside of the skin, or is it isolated to the skin? Yeah, I, to clarify, the, the Amgen antibody, I'm not worried that it's going to be more risky. Um, it's just harder to completely block IL-15 because there's so much of it around. So um, we're hoping for, for uh, some response with the IL-15 study. We're just thinking that targeting the receptor will be more potent. Um, yeah, IL-15 plays a normal role in the, in the body. So it helps uh, set up memory cells in the skin, um, maybe against viruses and, and other things, and not just autoimmunity. Um, there's been some uh, study that suggests resident memory T cells might play a role in melanoma um, control. And so we need to keep an eye on those. Uh, the good news is chronic uh, or severe infections, viral infections of the skin are, are actually well tolerated at this point. So smallpox has been eradicated, so we probably don't need them for that. Uh, resident memory T cells and IL-15 for that, where shingles is becoming less common now because we vaccinate against that. So um, HSV, uh, herpes infections, cold sores, those probably are, you know, could, could erupt if we treat, um, but they'll immediately reset new T cells and, and go away again. So we think that it'll be relatively well tolerated. NK cells also depend on IL-15 and those are innate cells in the blood that help control infection. Um, and so we're keeping an eye on those. Although IL-15 receptor has been in clinical trials for leukemia and, and shown to be pretty safe. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. Cool. And we have lots of thank yous coming in through the chat. Um, and I, I would echo that. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation and all that you've done to help vitiligo patients. And I know you've been doing a lot of adv advocacy work as well, like trying to get um, insurance coverage for treatments for patients. So all of that's very important and, and definitely worthwhile. So yeah, it's important work. It's fun too. I, I, I love my patients. I love the people with vitiligo and working with them and and my trainees uh, who know, like you, go on to start your own programs. And uh, it's exciting. That's a, it's a big part of what we do. Great. Thanks, everybody. Questions. Yes, thank you, John. And we'll uh, delay the post uh, to YouTube, but we will post this recording on YouTube. And we will have two speakers next month in March. So looking forward to reconvening with everyone. So thanks. Bye.